Hi, thank you so much for making it at the complete end of the day to our presentation, Who is the Right Way to Authenticate? Who are we? I'm Lakshmi Sudhir, I'm a senior security partner at Netflix. Hey everyone, I'm Divya, I work as a security engineer at Lyft. One of the things that Divya and I resonate on as security engineers is the need to incorporate security with any bold or innovative choices that our engineering uh, teams make for any of the solutions. For today, we're going to focus on authentication. We're going to talk about like what are the problems with the protocols or what are the common patterns. Then we're going to go a little more in depth about some of the protocols. Then we'll have some time for Q&A. With authentication. When I say authentication, there are a bunch of words that may pop in your mind. Could be passwords, could be OAuth, could be Kerberos. One of the most commonly associated uh, word with authentication is identity. Identity is who you are. And validation of who you are or validation of identity is what is authentication. There are different ways to establish our identity. and all of them rely on the basic principle of either the knowledge you possess, which could be passwords, pins, or any kind of a secret, or possession, right? Like you may have YubiKeys, you may have badges that you use to enter a building. So, and the other one is inherence, something that you inherently are. Commonly, we use our face IDs every morning to look into our phones. That could be classified into inherence. With Authentication right now, we could broadly classify this into like the user authentication and the service to service authentication. User authentication is clearly where the first interface between the user and the application. And service to service is all of these entities. For example, we were working through this presentation, trying to pull out reports and information. So we logged into an application. This application spoke to a bunch of backend APIs, those APIs. Uh, when to like pick some, pull some data from data repositories and maybe third party vendors, some other APIs brought that all together back and put it into a BI tool to produce some beautiful images and reports that we can ingest. So in each of these iterations, every entity involved had to identify itself to the other uh, entity saying, hey, I do have access. I want to authenticate that this is me, this is service A that's talking to service B. Can you process my request? In this complex ecosystem, it is bound to have a bunch of issues. So do you think there is a problem? Of course, yes. With so many interactions and so many ent entities talking to each other, there are a bunch of problems. When we think of authentication, it is the primary layer for us to uh, I mean, go ahead with any secure communication. That's the first layer for us. And it's bound to be important to make sure that we get authentication right. But it's still not the case. We have so many problems and that's why we are here today to discuss that. If you're a skeptic, need more data, I have some for you. So OS top 10 still places broken authentication at the top second. We've had authentication in like various forms from the beginning of times, right? Like there were these wars that were fought and how did you know that soldier belonged to your country? So you use secrets as such. So it has evolved and in the digital age as well, it's been there forever because that's the first layer in defense in depth. Why is this still a problem? The second thing is, this was the report that we pulled out. This is from HackerOne. This is the latest report about how much companies are spending for each class of vulnerability in their vulnerability disclosure programs. And we were actually surprised to see uh, improper authentication to be the class for which companies are spending a lot of money on right behind cross-site scripting. I mean, cross-site scripting has always been the reigning king, and that's for some other talk. But authentication with all of these protocols around, why is it still a problem? I mean, we started with passwords, then we thought complexity of passwords is important. Then we realized we cannot remember passwords for various applications. We started with single sign-on, a bunch of protocols came into picture. We have SAML, we have OAuth, and it is still something that our companies pay a lot for. They spend their money on. And this was mostly the inception point where Divya and I were like, it's not just a recency bias from what we are seeing with our work, but it is actually a problem. 
So we dug a little deeper, we looked into like uh, more uh, publicly available all of these disclosures, CrowdStream, Hacktivity and all of it and found authentication vulnerabilities. It's actually pretty interesting if you just click Authn, I mean Google Foo Authn and you look at all of it, there are like so many different vulnerabilities for authentication bypass. Then we realized that this is a pattern. So we went through all of this and we figured out that we could classify this coarsely into two parts. One is vulnerabilities because of the way a protocol is, because each protocol comes with different flavors, right? Like in OAuth, you have different grant types. And uh, the other part of it is context-based issues. That is more around how are you utilizing this protocol? So most of the issues ranked either as a part of the protocol, which is not being used correctly, or you're using everything right, but you don't understand the business context and there's some vulnerabilities that are arising out of that. So we thought that we could look into some of the protocols in depth today and see what are the protocol-based issues and what are the context-based issues. And coming to back to the point of us security engineers being able to empower our developers, how can we achieve that? For today, we're gonna to talk about JSON Web Tokens. I know you've heard enough, this is gonna be short. And we're gonna talk a little about OAuth and then let's remove passwords. We're trying to move towards passwordless, so a little bit about passwordless. Uh, schemes and magic links. JSON Web Tokens. Tokens are essentially identifiers, right? A unique token is what we present to say that I'm Lakshmi, she's Divya, someone's Chris, and all of that. So what's a JART? JART is nothing but a JSON blob. It has key value pairs because it's a JSON blob. And then it is being encoded using Base64 and it is digitally signed using symmetric or asymmetric algorithms. With JOTS, one of the things is we just sign it. So remember that it just provides integrity, not confidentiality. We're encoding it, not encrypting it. So whatever is in these JOTS actually are visible to anyone. Anyone can go ahead and decode. Now, with JOTS, let's see where it works. So uh, let's say I want to log into a third-party application using some social auth. I, for instance, let's say it's Google, I'm trying to log into some third-party application using Google. I initially authenticate myself using a known secret, the initial secret, which could be my password, that goes to the authentication server. Then this authentication server validates, uh, says, well, this is the right password, this is Lakshmi, and then provides a JOT back to the user. I go ahead, present it to the third-party application, and in case they're using like asymmetric, it uses the public key of the authentication server, validates uh, decodes and then validates the signature and if it is the right signature, it knows that this token has not been tampered with and then that goes back and uh, it processes the request that I have made to this third party application. Where do we see a popular use of JOTS? We would have seen this as access tokens or refresh tokens in OAuth. You would have seen it in OpenID Connect as identity tokens and they're also used as user session objects, but more about that later. Why? We heard so many talks today about how easy it is to exploit JOTS. We have like so many other talks which say, oh no, JOTS are evil. We have workloads, that are workflows and uh, all those algorithms around why you shouldn't be using JOT for scenario A, scenario B, scenario C. But why is it so prevalent? One of the reasons we found it's so prevalent, and these were things that we heard from developers, was one, it provides authentication and authorization. We saw the authentication scenario where the token is presented, you validate the signature, and you are authenticated, and that could be used to validate if you were authenticated or not. You're logging in from an authenticated context. Authorization, yeah, you have the key value pairs. You could utilize that to make some authorization decisions, but this was something that was also mentioned. The other thing is stateless. So when a JOT is created by an authentication server, it's just given to the user and the only time you care about this JOT is when it's presented to you, you validate it and go on. You don't really have to maintain any state, have a backend, at least that was one of the reasons given. Uh, it's compact and lightweight. Well, compact because it's a key value pair, you could have information. Lightweight is debatable. I mean, it depends on how much information you're gonna put into this JOT. So we could leave that at that. And scalable compared to session tokens. So traditional session tokens are what? They are strings, high entropy, longer ones, unique, and all of it. 
you would have to generate that for every uh, user who's trying to log in the authentication server would have to like process all of those requests. But with JOTS, you just create it, give it back. You don't have to store and maintain um, more of a uh, state. So it's more scalable. Information exchange. So you could use the payload. We're going to look into the structure in just a bit. But you can use this JSON blob to like add more information. So this token doesn't just serve the purpose of being a token. You could also add more information and exchange information with third parties, mostly in like uh, protocols like OAuth. That would be something that is um, pretty useful. So these are some of the reasons they predominantly use charts. Let's get into the structure of a chart. We have a header, we have a payload, we have a signature. Uh, they are all base64 encoded, and uh, the header contains the algorithm which you're using to uh, validate the signature. The application server we saw before actually looks into the algorithm and decides like how do you go about validating it, what algorithm to use. Then we have the payload. Now this payload is what contains user entitlements. They're also called claims. So you have some predefined claims around like expiry, what time does this chart expire? And then you have more information about the user. You could have the issuer. You can have a bunch of information there. So some of them are already defined in the RFC. Well, they're more custom ones that you could create. And we were talking about how you can achieve authorization. Maybe you can have the authorization context here. But one thing to note is to make sure that you don't have anything that is sensitive because these are just encoded, not encrypted. The, then you have the signature part. Uh, which is the one that is going to be validated. <coughs> Quick trivia. How many of you raise of hands think this is a valid chart? OK, I see a few hands here. You're all right. Unfortunately, this is a valid chart. That is because I know there's no signature component, but we see that the algorithm is none. And um, when the validation, when the application server is trying to validate, it looks at none, and it's like, all right, there's no algorithm. Let's just process the request. This must be an authentic chart. So I, as an attacker, can completely bypass authentication if there are no checks for none. I understand this has been there since 2015. This has been like uh, spoken about since 2015. The reason I bring this up is because, one, there are legacy flows that still have this, and people have forgotten about it when they've moved on uh, to like using the right libraries. Most libraries have checks for this. But this is more of the protocol-based issue that I spoke about in our previous slide where we talk about like authentication patterns and what are the vulnerable patterns that exist. So JOT RFC supported none. Maybe it was for some business case that was not related to authentication, right? Like that was created for some other business case. But this is one of the examples where you take a protocol, you just use it the way it is without complete context about it. These are some of the vulnerabilities that could result. For this specific problem, how can we remediate this? So the minimum viable solution is always going to be where uh, you could check that the algorithm none is never accepted. The next best solution is around whitelisting all the algorithms that you support to validate a chart. And the best case scenario, which probably is not, I mean, very feasible in all use cases, would be to actually hard code the algorithm that you use to always validate a chart. So these are some of the remediations that could work. Choosing the right library. This is always a problem, be it with charts or be it with any other case, is to make sure that for your tech stack, you make the right choice of library. With these here, uh, we have like uh, different, uh, for Java, Node.js, and Go. And we can see that uh, you have support for some of the claims and some of the algorithms itself. So it's just not enough to make a choice of the right library. For example, uh, I think Go doesn't support some algorithms, but uh, it supports some others. So it's important for you to identify like what are the strong algorithms and like what do we want to use versus letting, I mean, and also are we invoking the right functions to validate these claims? So it's not enough to just get the library that works or seems very secure, but making sure you go into it and like uh, uh, look into your use case and figure out like what are the things that we want to turn on or invoke versus nothing is also extremely important. Now, let's assume we are doing everything right. We have the right library. We are looking into like the none algorithm. We even like look into all of our claims and make the right decisions based on the protocol. What else could go wrong? Now, let's say I'm a user. I'm an attacker here. And I use an authentication server. I present the, uh, my secret. I get my JOT. I present it to the mail server because I have access to the mail server. That's a valid JOT. It's not malicious. We don't have the algorithm none. And the mail server validates the JOT. It's 
the right jot, it has all the, I mean, uh, it, it validates as the right signature, it's an authentic jot, it services uh, the request here. One of the things that uh, maybe I'll think that, okay, this is great, I have the right jot, but I, in my company, don't have access to the finance part of it, and I just want to go, I'm just curious, maybe want to look at like someone else's payroll, or just increase mine, try to see if that works. When I present this jot to uh, the finance operations uh, service, it validates it's the right chart, right? Like it's not a job that was tampered with, but this is the right chart. So it looks into it. And what if it goes ahead and sells the it because the chart is valid. So that's where the context based authentication issues come into picture, where in this context, it's extremely important to not to just rely on the chart for authentication was like authorization. There are ways that you could implement it, which we're going to talk in the next slide. One of the pre-defined pre, uh, claims in the JOT RFC is the audience parameters. So you could use this. I mean, there are various ways of uh, uh, remediating this. One of the uh, things you could use is the audience uh, claim that you have in the JOT RFC. You could just add that this user has access to, let's say, just the user database, not finance, or finance and something, not something else. It's not just enough to use this claim, but it is extremely important that the client application as well has the right way to go validate this claim look into it and make sure it makes its authorization decisions from there. So this is where the context comes into picture with using JOTS or anything else. We were talking about how user session, how JOTS are used as user session objects and why it is so actively discouraged. But coming back to the point of it's anyways being used, so we as security engineers need to make sure that we bring in the right context, we put in the effort to make sure we secure it as much as we can. So the logout scenario is where it gets tricky with JOTS. We have the expiry time, we know that uh, JOTS expire uh, at a certain time. You, some folks argue that we could just use a shorter TTL, but that short is subjective. Again, it could be five minutes, it could be forever. So that's not something that we could rely on. And that's where one of the unique uh, claims that you could use is a JTI, where you can identify each of the tokens, uh, have the JDI, the identifier, the unique identifier for each token. And then you can go about and like have user ID with the JDI, and then when a user logs out, you could go about and revoke this chart. There are many issues associated with this because now it's no longer stateless. I mean, you would have to go about this. Every time you validate a JOT, you need to look into the identifier and come back to like looking into the user ID and the uh, associated JTI. So it's, it's a bit of hassle. And I think the other uh, challenge with this is around like how do you uh, propagate all of this to your client applications and make sure that they get it right. This is mostly the challenge. And one of the things we could do as security engineers if it's ever being used as a user session object is probably do a deep dive threat model on like this aspect of it and make sure you cover all the scenarios if it is being used anyway and pretty prevalent. We spoke about some of the protocol-based issues, some of the context-based issues. Some of the key things to keep in mind if you're using JOT or when uh, the teams are using JOT is to validate the algorithm claim and it's not enough to just validate. You need to have stronger algorithms because from the talk this morning, we know that a job could just be taken and offline you could just uh, brute force it and get a secret if you're still not using strong algorithms. The other aspect is to validate all the applicable claims. And with these claims, there's another class of issues, anything that uh, you have a value for. Injection vulnerabilities are also pretty common, so there's more to that, to validating and uh, actually uh, looking into these claims and making decisions based on that. And I couldn't say this enough, we would have to handle the revocation really securely, so if they're being used as user session objects, it is important for us as security engineers to go in and do a deep dive and see if we can make it as secure as we can. Uh, I just mentioned the JOTs are primarily used as access tokens and refresh tokens in OAuth. So now, let's dig a little deeper into OAuth. The VI is going to take the stage now. Okay, so hopefully you are still with us. Uh, next, we are moving on to open authorization. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, Sorry. I'll try to keep up with this GIF or GIF, whatever it's pronounced. 
Uh, so in OAuth, you have three entities. You have the client, resource owner, and the auth server. So the general scenario is that the client is uh, requesting access to a particular resource in the resource owner. But the resource owner says, I don't know you. So it needs a way to authorize and authenticate itself. So that's where you have the authorization that comes into picture. And the client reaches out to the authorization server, says, hey, I am so-and-so. And like Lakshmi mentioned before, it proves its identity to ensure its authentication. Now, the authorization server has enough context on the client to verify that it is indeed who it claims to be. And it generates an artifact. This artifact is then passed on to the client. And the client now uses this artifact and passes it on to any resource owner that it needs to fetch resources from. Now, I'm terming this a very neutral term called artifact. It's nothing but parsable code, also called tokens. In OAuth scenario, this is going to be an access token, a refresh token, or an OAuth, um, authorization code. Now, this is nothing but um, authorization code is something that is understandable between the client and the auth server. The access token and refresh tokens are something that is understandable between the chain of services that the client may interact with. And it's supposed to be service agnostic, but containing enough context on the client so that every service knows who, um, who is asking for the resource access and what kind of access to resources that they have. So when I said um, these, uh, like these three are the entities and these interact with each other, the client, when it starts uh, communicating with the auth server, there are different types of grants that are available for the client to interact with. Uh, there are five types uh, defined in the OAuth page. Um, so these are going to be implicit, password, authorization code, client credentials, and device and refresh token. Immediately disregard the first two. So implicit and password is something that you should not be familiar with. If you are familiar with it, it should be in the negative connotation. So um, implicit and password, as the name suggests, do include client secrets when the first request goes from the client to the authorization server. Uh, the rest of them, which is auth code, client credentials, and device and refresh token, kind of have some security baked into them. And I say kind of because authorization code um, reduces the risk by separating the um, auth endpoint, which is the server that contains the context on the client, and the token endpoint, which actually handles the tokens. In client credential, there is an assumption made on the client, which I'll speak to it later. So even though client credentials, as the name suggests, does indeed send the client credentials, there is some assumption made there that makes it OK. The last one, which is device and refresh token, as the name suggests, is exclusively used for those purposes when you are directly interacting with the device or when you are just uh, when the client is contacting the auth server just to get the refresh token. Again, these are all very context specific grants which you need to understand before using. Um, and throw back to the second or the third slide, as we classified the problems into protocol specific issues and context specific issues, the grant types come somewhere into the protocol specific issues, but more on that later. So I spoke a lot about tokens, access tokens, refresh tokens, authorization code, now, the one thing uh, that the workflow depends on is a trusted environment. When I say trusted environment, it means the client, resource owner, and the auth server, all of them are assumed inherently secure. So you assume that the client or the user agent or the browser or whichever service makes the uh, call on the user's behalf is secure, has defense in depth. Then the resource owner, again, the resource server has defense in depth. And the authorization server, again, has defense in depth. So the OAuth lives up to its definition of a secure authentication protocol given this trusted environment. However, the next sentence is of particular interest to me. If the format isn't clear here, I'll read it out to you. The token may be lost, stolen, intercepted, proxied, replayed, or altered. And the funny part about this is each and every verb has at least two attacks associated with it. So token in OAuth scenario is like super important, which is why um, the two metadata security tags that are associated with tokens are that it be passed over TLS and it have a shorted TTL. And like Lakshmi mentioned before, when I say short TTL, how many of you thought about like five minutes is okay? Or like, how many of you thought 30 seconds is OK? 
Or how many of you thought one year seems fine as long as we are not leaving it blank? <laughs> so yeah, so there is like short TTL is subjective. But on the other hand, you can't just go around and keep saying like five minutes TTL sounds all right to me because it won't fly with all services. So coming out with like a strict black and white security um, best practice there is going to be pretty difficult. So one thing to keep in mind here, again, this falls back to the protocol specific issue, is how do you exactly secure that token and how do you interpret the different tags that are available for that uh, token? So yeah, uh, the FUBAR scenario in this case is um, given an absence of trusted environment, even if an attacker gets hold of one of these tokens, it's pretty uh, easy to escalate it to a full on takeover. And the Moving on from that, so the other contextual part of it is how we are treating the client. Now in OAuth scenario, you could have a static registration or a dynamic registration. And most of the cases, our services want some freedom associated, so they want to accept apps or users that want to register or get authenticated on the fly. Now when this is the case, ideally, the client should be treated as public. And when I say public, the default assumption is that the clients cannot hold on to the secrets securely. However, for ease of use and innovative engineering choices, most of the time, the clients are treated as confidential and you can either find uh, clients baked in, um, secrets baked into them or the secrets or the usernames, passwords, or anything that distinctly identifies the client or the user who is using the client is pretty visibly um, like found either in GitHub or in the app itself. So yeah, ideally what should they should be doing is using an authorization code grant, but they end up using the implicit grant. And the problems with implicit grant, again, stands a talk on its own. Uh, but for this talk, we are going to be focusing on auth code grant. So given we have a dynamic uh, client who wants to register and wants to authenticate themselves, what could help is having some kind of a context on the client. This is where token binding as a concept could help. Now, when I say token binding, what it means is like when the client reaches out to the authorization in the first call, there is an assumption of a client and a server negotiation that has happened. Now, when this negotiation happens, a bunch of context specific client metadata is shared with the server and the server either records it or at least has a unique identifier identifying this particular client instance. So for every workflow that comes after that, it remembers that, okay, this is the client that reached out to me. And this is the maybe the timestamp when it reached out. Uh, and this is where I was I'm supposed to give the token to. So going on to the technical details of it, token binding, when it comes in a parsable token, just realizes as a key pair that is associated with every token. And this key pair is known both for the client and the server. Um, there is a token binding ID that is given to uh, this key pair and this token. And if you want to relate to it, you can use the JTI from JOT. It's just a unique identifier that is given to the key pair and the token. Um, and as usual, because we are talking about authentication, you want to know that whatever this token binding payload, you need to make sure that this came from the client and it is received by the server. And if you're talking about a mutual scenario, you also need to make sure that who replied to the payload. So you have signature scheme options. And again, depending on uh, your client, if it's a Fitbit or if it's a IoT device or if it's a supercomputer, you can pick your own signature schemes, either from the strongest to the weakest. Uh, finally, in token binding, you do have extensions and binding type. Extensions are gonna be very uh, service specific. So let's say your service wants something like, um, hey, I have these many servers uh, behind the authorization wall. So I'm gonna just give you in the token binding about the different scopes that you can apply for. So things like that could be added to the extension. Um, and in my opinion, you can equate this to the claims that are available in JOTS. So moving on, um, extending this token binding as a concept to OAuth and grant types. Um, that's where Pixie comes into picture. Uh, so Pixie, if you are familiar with it already, is going to be proof of key code exchange. Hopefully I got that right. Um, so what happens in Pixie is when the client reaches out to the authorization endpoint, in the first call, it sends an authorization request and a computed value, which is going to be derived from a seed, which we'll call a code verifier. 
So what it sends to the authorization server at this point is going to be this computed outcome plus the method that it used for computing this outcome. Now the authorization server, uh, remember that client negotiation. So it remembers that negotiation call and it knows that, okay, this is the seed that the client used and this is the outcome that I'm expecting from uh, a set of clients. So once this happens, the authorization server at this point sends back the authorization code. And for every subsequent call, the client then uses the code challenge, uh, which is the outcome of the code verifier computed the outcome that I was talking about. Um, and it also appends every request that it sends to the auth server. The auth server in every subsequent call, it gets an additional context along with the client ID. So it gets the client ID and this pre-known historical information about the client. So this way it's preventing against um, interception attacks. And because every request is gonna be unique, it's gonna be very hard to take over the client unless you are like completely hijacking the client on that end. So yeah, we have uh, three entities again, like I said, we have the API server, we have the auth server endpoint. Um, and what we were gonna show is the PyCode code verifier, uh, which basically uh, showed you like the code challenge computation using a code verifier. And this um, code challenge in the code verifier would be then sent back to the auth server. The auth server would then see the grant type, which is gonna be code. It's gonna see the code challenge parameter with the code challenge value. And it's also gonna see a redirect URL. Um, in the demo, it was gonna be google.com. So the auth code, which was gonna be sent back was gonna be google.com and authorization code as a parameter and the value attached to it. So once this auth code is received by the client, or in this case, the PyCode code verifier code, uh, this, is, uh, this authorization code would then be used for every subsequent request, um, and then it would request the access token. Now once the auth server now has a record of the client ID and the code challenge that it received in the first call, and it would then verify this on the server side and then send the access token. Now, once this uh, client receives this access token, for every subsequent call made to the resource server, which is gonna be an API server, um, the API server on its end would parse this access token, which is gonna be a JWT token. It would see the issuer, and the issuer would contain the client ID, and it would also contain the lifespan of it. So if it expires in five minutes, like short TTL, then it would immediately um, accept it. If it's beyond five minutes, then it would reject it. Okay, so let's say your uh, Pixie option is proving too costly and your client cannot hold on to uh, or cannot do that much computation. The other alternative that you have is going the mutual TLS route. So bringing the token binding concept here, all you need to know is establish some form of historical information between the client and the server. So at this point, um, during the negotiation phase of the client and the server, uh, what happens is the client says, okay, I'm gonna send you a self-signed certificate in my subsequent calls. And you, when you break open the certificate, this is what you're gonna see. And that's gonna contain some context specific client instance metadata that the server is gonna make note of. So if you see that you are just leaving out the code verifier part of it and substituting that with the client certificate at this point. Um, so for every subsequent call, like I mentioned before, rather than sending just the access token, it's gonna append the certificate along with it. So we covered the uh, problems that came with using different grant types, and we also spoke about what could happen with the token itself, and what kind of assumptions you need to make about it. Now, there is still one problem that we haven't let go of, which is the redirect URL and the value that we pass in it. So the redirect URL, and I picked this particular CVE because of how simple it was to do this attack. Uh, so in this particular case, the attacker just appended a extra percentage symbol and that messed up the server validation. So the attacker was then able to provide their own uh, redirect URL and every authentication uh, authorization code, refresh token or access token that came after it uh, just was re redirected to the um, attacker URL. So how do you prevent this? So depending on your service, depending on your risk appetite, there are three options available. The bare minimum option that you can go with is uh, like extend the level of trust that you would give the client. So you assume the client is trusted, you accept the redirect URL that it passes, you do the bare minimum, does it look like a URL check, and then just provide the code to it. 
that's the bare minimum you can do let's say you don't want to do that the next available um, better in risk acceptance is having a white list of redirect urls on your authorization server so this way if the client sends like hey please send the code to me in this particular redirect url you check against the whitelist and then you provide the code but you there is still one action that the uh, server side needs to take the best available option and as a security engineer i would say go for it but you might see pushback from engineering teams is having just one registered redirect url on the server side so irrespective of where the calls come from in the client or whatever values are provided in the redirect url that the client sends the server is always going to send the um, any code or any tokens only to this particular endpoint and of course there are assumptions made here as well that the endpoint is completely under the um, services control and it's not hijacked by someone but at least it removes that um, dynamicity from the redirect url passing so um, we spoke about jart and we spoke about oauth and we saw some common problems with it like how do you choose uh, protocol specific options and how do you choose these multiple options that are available in specific contexts naturally when we are evolving on authentication the next step is going to be doing away with passwords completely so i see it as like oauth without secrets at all and you are still dealing with a dynamic client and you are still sending out tokens and you are still dealing with short lived tokens um and you also inherit the same risk of transporting over a secure channel but at this point you are just shifting the blame to the email provider or the phone network provider so before this happens just extending the defenses that we have talked about so far and applying it in the passwordless scenario what we can see is number 1 make sure that whichever endpoint that we are sending this secret to making sure that we verify them so either this is a verified email or a verified mobile number and this mirrors that client server negotiation that we talked about that the server knows which client it's going to talk to the second one is going to be generate uh, the token generation so whatever token is generated and we are sending it out for uh, logging in this needs to be sufficiently random it and some capability that only the auth server that is sending out the token can produce it and again this extends that code verifier or the code seed um, like yeah the next one is going to be um, token metadata which is issued for claim similar to what we saw in jart um, we need to make sure that whatever secret that we are sending to is reaching the intended audience which means that if you are sending to the email or the mobile number if you don't want to deal with pii on your authorization server just make sure that whatever client id that you're using to map like matches that mobile id uh, mobile number or email id continuing on uh, the same if you're using the secrets in the form of a jot token make sure that you use the correct algorithms uh, make sure that your token metadata does not contain any secrets um, and also make sure that you're again harping on the same thing like your payload is encoded and not encrypted um the next one is again bringing the token binding concept here uh, make sure that your authorization server has a track record of when the token was sent who it was sent to and whether it was redeemed or not um and finally um this is pretty common uh, which is for rate limiting a lot of times we forget because we are blessed with so much computational power uh, we kind of overlook this rate limiting uh, problem that we face so make sure that you set um, realistic time limits on how many times a service or a user is going to request for uh, a token for logging in so given that uh, what we saw today was that there were many ways to authenticate uh, we saw that there were uh, many ways to implement them incorrectly but it can be categorized into two buckets which is context and protocol specific uh, but finally the focal point of what we want to say in this presentation is that uh, making sure that security engineers or sec security conscious developers are empowered enough to make secure choices um, just make sure that authentication is implemented correctly so thanks oh yeah so in case you want to see it in action um the code is in github uh we have 10 minutes we can try to load it and drive uh but yeah if you want to see the code it's there